morning, Calvary Assembly. How are we doing today? Ah, that was mediocre at best. Good morning. How are we doing today? There we go. It's sunny outside, people. All right, would you stand with us? All right. I don't know how many of you are in tune with news or global news coverage, um, but there are some really heartbreaking things going on right now in our uh, international community in the world. Um, but the truth is, you probably know that you don't actually have to look that far to find brokenheartedness. Um, there's brokenheartedness in our families, and there's brokenheartedness in our friends, and in the people who are close to us. And honestly, a lot of times, there's brokenheartedness in us, and there might be brokenheartedness in you this morning. Things that feel like they are irreparable beyond repair. And so the question is, in this state that we live in where there's both global um, brokenheartedness and where there is personal brokenheartedness, what comfort does God offer to us? What words of, of solace, what words of comfort are we given? And this is Psalm 31, 14. And this is what God tells us over and over and over again. It says, but I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. I'm gonna read that again. I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are are in your hands. These times, both on an international, seemingly impossible for us to do anything to help type of scale, and in the middle of our lives while we struggle with things that seems like we have no way to overcome them scale, my times are in your hands. That is the invitation we receive. And so this morning, um, what I would like you to do, if you are willing, um, is to put your hands out like you're receiving something. And so we're going to spend this morning worshiping, and we're first going to acknowledge God for who he is, but then we're going to ask. Um, we're going to ask for him to invade our personal circumstances. We're going to ask for him to invade our families. We're going to ask for him to invade our communities and to transform and to make things right. And that takes faith this morning, church. So when we take this posture of receiving as we praise, it is because we are putting our trust in God. We are saying, I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Can we put that back on the screen? So keeping our, our hands out in a receiving posture, let's read this together. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Come on, can we do it like we believe it? I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Lord, those are not empty words this morning. This is our, our worship is our prayer offering to you this morning, God, but it's also our asking, would you please come into the wilderness that we feel like we are living in right now, where it seems like there are things that are impossible for us to have any sort of part in changing, but we know that heaven's resources are available to us when we pray. And so we start this morning calling down the resources of heaven and saying, Lord, fall on your people. Let your spirit bring good things. Let your spirit bring life from the place where there is death. We give you all of the glory. We give you all of the praise. We give you all of the credit that you deserve this morning, Lord. It's not us. It is you within us, and you are shaping us and changing us, and that is the most freeing thing that we have this morning, Lord. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace come on we come running to this hour my hope is only Jesus For my life is wholly bound to His And oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine Yet not I, but through Christ in me When we continue to offer a praise offering to our Lord this morning Sing the night is done. 
The night is dark, but I am not forsaken For by my side, the Savior, He will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing For in my need, His power is displayed
worthy of it. We only ask for your help because you are worthy of it, because you freely give it. That is the only reason we come before you, because you love us, God. We love you, Lord. All right, let's invite heaven down this morning, church. Come on.
that I've recognized, I was talking with my wife about the other day, is that the generation that is coming up, the, the generation of people that are college age and younger, are experiencing such incredible levels of anxiety and such incredible levels of loneliness. Um, and what I would like this morning is if we could sing that bridge again as a church, but if we could be praying as we do it specifically for this upcoming generation, because what I know is that Satan doesn't want to see them become leaders, but I know that God has the authority over those dark powers and that he wants to raise up leaders in our community, and in our world, who will to carry his light and who will shine it in the darkness. So as we sing, shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets, I want to pray specifically for them. If you would even uh, extend your hands, if you see a young person around you, if you would extend your hands towards them, I know that's a little uncomfortable, church, but if you see a young person anywhere around you, just, you can even be like here if you don't want to extend all the way, but just find a young person and we're going to sing this bridge specifically over them. The name of Jesus, which has power over every darkness, and over every enemy. We pray for our young generation. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus. One more time, church, is praying for this upcoming generation in the name of Jesus. So shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. pray over this upcoming generation, your power and your authority and your freedom over them. You will do it because you are faithful and we declare it because we believe it. Yes. Come on, let's continue to ask heaven, ask God to release heaven's resources on earth this morning.
pray It's time to overcome the unbelief Come on, let it rise, church I pray because you're God And I'm not giving up It's time to overcome the Come on, even after you have to tell your heart to believe, sing it out I humbly bow in faith Cause you hear his prayer I pray And it's time to overcome the unbelief I pray because I pray because you're God And I'm not giving up It's time to overcome the unbelief I humbly bow in faith You hear his prayer I pray It's time to overcome the unbelief I pray because you're God And I'm not giving up It's time to overcome the unbelief Lord, help me overcome the unbelief We will at last see church this morning I have some great news some great news God has made a way Calvary when Jesus was on the cross he made a way so no matter what you're going through no matter what circumstances you face he has made a way he has done it all it is accomplished it's over it's finished finito it's done the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has accomplished what we need this morning. He said, if you would speak to your mountain, speak to your mountain, it will increase your faith. Speak to your mountain. So Lord, I just declare this morning, Father, you would increase our faith as we speak to our mountains this morning. No matter where we are, Father, no matter where we are, we can rest assured that you're on the throne and you're reigning, Father. Nothing goes unnoticed by you, nothing. Mm. Father, we pause and we give you thanks for what you're bringing us through. Your word in Psalms declares, yea, do we go through the valley in the shadow of death. We will fear nothing because you are with us always. So Father, we thank you in advance for what you're taking us through and what you're bringing us through. Father, no matter what it seems like, no matter what it looks like, you have made a way. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. Oh, wait, the, John said it earlier. That's mediocre. Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. Thank you. We can be seated. We can be seated. In the seat behind or in front of you, there's a connection card. We would love to connect with you. Find out what's going on you, pray with you, pray, pray for you. So if you would fill that out. Children, we're going to release you to your classes and uh, prepare your hearts to receive from the Lord this morning. Amen. morning. Is everybody ready for Thanksgiving? I thought we would start early this morning. Um, 
So our church has been contributing to a fund that we call Adoption Assistance, and we recently were able to help our very first uh, couple uh, be able to bring home their child. They were actually watching on live stream this morning, and for the first time they were saying and praying the name of Jesus over their brand new family. Can we just thank God for that? Yeah. <laughs> Also, uh, how many enjoyed uh, Pastor Jonathan's message last Sunday? He did a great job. Yeah. And uh, you might not know, but this month actually marks 14 years he has been on staff at Calvary Assembly, entering his 15th year. And uh, so he will tell you half of that was the interview to get the job, but that's not quite true. <laughs> and, uh, and then... Um, uh, just, uh, it won't matter so much to this service, but in the next service it will. And that is right after the, the game, or right after the service today, I'm heading to the game. And uh, for, for the Buffalo Bills, when I'm in the stadium, <laughs> when I'm in the stadium, they don't lose and they need my help. And <laughs> so. Um, what, one other thing before I get started this morning, and that is uh, sometimes when it gets to Thanksgiving time, people get a little apprehensive about gathering together with family uh, and, and friends and not sure where the conversation could go. And so uh, what we've done is uh, we actually provided uh, 52 questions that you could ask around the Thanksgiving table that would help you understand and better enjoy your time with your family and friends. It's questions for anyone, questions for grandparents, questions for married people, questions for, there's somebody else, oh, growing up, yeah. A lot of, a lot of great things you could learn about your family. And wonderful thing about some of our grandparents and older folks, the older they get, they lose their filter. You might actually hear things you've never heard before. So. Um, <laughs> Young people don't have their filter yet, so I kind of know what to expect. We're in a series about being surprised by grace, and we're taking a look at the life of Moses, and, uh, and we're, we're stunned, really, by how often the grace of God shows through in the life of a man that we equate with law and judgment. And this morning's uh, example of this is no uh, different, and we'll pick it up, the story in uh, Exodus chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. That's not a moral term, it's, it's actually a Hebrew word. It, it means either thorny or clay place, so they're, they're leaving that. And they're traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered, go out in front of the people, Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the, uh, the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? I think a, a point I'd like you to think about as we process this information is breaking chains and changing hearts. It's not the same thing. Breaking chains and changing hearts is not the same thing. It's very easy to assume that whatever is holding us back in life or limiting life in some way is the problem. And if we could resolve or remove that issue, then our lives would be better. It would be what we wanted them to be. Um, so we, we sometimes think in terms like this, if I could be free of that person in my life, that person is limiting my life. Then I, and, and, and they 
Maybe they get rid of that person in their life. Have you ever noticed how often they wind up in a relationship with someone just like that? How, how does that happen? If I could just break this addiction, then my life would be better. And how often do we see people who break the addiction but then return to that addiction or another addiction? If, if I could just have a, a change of heart, well, the truth is, is, without a change of heart, we will tend to gravitate back to the chains of bondage. Israel came to a place where there was no water. Now, they'd been in a similar situation just two chapters earlier in Exodus chapter 15, where there was water, but it was undrinkable. And God miraculously supplied a way to remedy that water and to make it drinkable for them. <clears throat> so what did they learn from that experience? The answer is nothing. They didn't learn anything from that experience. And so the, when they get to this situation, this is now the fourth time that Exodus records that they're complaining, and they actually elevate their complaint. They, they complained in chapter 14, in chapter 15, in chapter 16, in chapter 17, and how many have a sneaking suspicion this will not be the last time they complain. Yeah. And uh, so they, but this time they elevated uh, their complaint. And uh, what they did, is they quarreled. They didn't just say they didn't like something, they, they started a quarrel. And, and, and the Hebrew word, it's, it's kind of interesting, the uh, underlying idea behind this is, is it's like a lawsuit, like you're bringing somebody to court. You're suing them. And uh, Moses is being accused, basically, of attempting genocide, bringing this entire nation out into the wilderness so that they will all die. And, and Moses says, he, you can notice the phrase that they are about to stone me. That's not just him exaggerating the situation. That's how angry and frustrated they were. So they're ready to execute Moses. Moses had not been leading them to water. Moses had been leading them where God told him. This is the thing about us. We often think that what God does is he leads us from this place to provision, to provision, to provision. And God actually has another agenda that he's working on in, in our lives. He wants to teach us things about the life of faith, and he wants to teach us how to trust him. And as it turns out, if all we have is all the provision we always need, we don't learn to trust. We don't. Uh, this is how the psalmist would say it in Psalm 95, if you would only listen to his voice today. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as you did, as Israel did at Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For there your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. Give us water to drink. Now they've moved into a demanding mode. Don't raise your hand, but how many know somebody who's like that? They don't ask, they demand, and it becomes a problem. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? You see, they're imagining the worst possible outcome, and they're projecting it into the future. And they're imagining that that worst possible outcome is intentional, and they see a motive behind it. And so they, they accuse Moses and God of having these horrible motives. And then they say, is, the, is not the Lord among us? This is a challenge for us because we tend to think that if there is a need, God must be absent, that the presence of a need proves the absence of God. They have a lot they need to learn in the situation that they are in. And the question I have for you, are we really any different? Do we assume that the... the God is supposed to provide for every need in advance so that we never have to work through anything, walk through anything, or learn anything. Do we ever assume that God has a hidden motive? Maybe not for everybody, but at least for us. I know he does some nice things for some people, but it seems like when it comes to me, and then we, we assume a hidden motive. Do we believe that the presence of a problem proves the absence of God in our lives? So in essence, Israel is putting God on trial. It's like a court martial. And, and, and it says that this is where they put God to the test. And God had originally intended to test them here and teach them, 
but they turn the tables and they put God on trial, like a trial of ordeal. In fact, the word there is in Hebrew, it's rib, and it actually means like a covenant lawsuit. So they present all their grievances, they make all their accusations, they charge God with a failure to provide for them, they charge God with a failure to protect them, and they charge God with failure to be present with them. So God is guilty, guilty, guilty. And what are they going to do with their verdict? And the answer is uh, they're going to kill somebody. If we're all going to die in the wilderness, we're going to kill the person that God gave to us, and that's Moses, and he's going to go first. Well, what's fascinating is in all of this, God still meets the need of Israel because God is gracious. And if someone were making that kind of accusation about you, how would you respond? And God responds with grace. Now, last week, Pastor Jonathan talked about how God fed them and taught them how to rest. This week, we're going to see how God provides water for them. So this is fascinating and a reasonable question for us to think about. Why don't we believe God's provision, previous help, reveals his intentions towards us? Like if I ask, has God ever done anything for you in your life at some point? I think most of us would raise our hand. But when we think about the future, we're not so sure. We don't assume that because he helped us. It's almost like we, maybe he did that by an accident or an oversight or because we were connected to somebody else. And, and they, we don't project God's blessings in our thinking. When we have a problem, we project that really well. We struggle to project on the provision that we have in our life. In fact, uh, if, if you have enough money right now, I'm pretty much sure you still want more. And uh, if you have a, a retirement savings account, I'm pretty sure you would like to have more money in there than you have right now. And if you are employed with a company, I'm pretty sure you'd like to get more money from that company than you're currently being compensated. And if you own a company, I'm pretty sure you would like to see the profit margin higher than it is right now. And the nature of provision is not that it brings peace to us, it's that now that I have this, I'm gonna need more because, well, we don't know how things are going to turn out. So we project our problems and we panic because we can't see the pattern of grace. That's why we panic. We naturally project our problems. We don't project provision. We need a better perspective. We need the perspective of grace. So uh, the rock of Horeb, Horeb means it's a dry place. It's a desolate place. You wouldn't really expect to find water there. That's part of their frustration. Why would Moses lead them to a place where there's no expectation to find water? And Moses doesn't know what to do. The good news is God knows what to do. So when we don't know what to do, that doesn't mean God is confused or perplexed. He knows what to do. And he told Moses, take some of the elders of Israel, walk before the uh, congregation of Israel. And, and, he, and, and what he's doing is, is, this is a symbol of convening a court. Right? You want a trial? Here's the court. He assembles the jury. Here's the elders. And look at this. God told Moses to take the staff that he used to strike the Nile. What is this? This is the picture of judgment. When, when, when Moses struck the Nile and the waters turned to blood. That was a picture of God's judgment. So, so now everybody's seeing this picture. This court is being convened. We have a jury. And here comes someone with a, the staff that represents judgment. I guarantee every eye was locked. Like something is going to happen here. The Israelites knew what that staff represented. And Moses was told to strike the rock. Why would God tell him to do that? This is a picture of judgment. It's a picture of judgment. They're putting God on trial and they're going to judge God. 
And before you think that that's so out of bounds, are you sure we don't do the same thing? How many times when there's some atrocity in the world, do you hear the reoccurring mantra of our culture? If God were real and if God were good and if God were powerful, how could God allow these things? Who's to blame? We have people committing horrible atrocities. Who's to blame? Must be God's fault. Must be. We put God on trial. And if we get some reasonable information, we might find him not guilty. This is the, it's baked into the human heart. Something goes wrong, it must be God's fault. If it resolves in a positive way, or someone can explain it to us, then maybe we'll let God off the hook this time. What they want God to do is to prove he is God by doing what they want him to do. This is not a new thing. This is not just a human thing. When Jesus was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, isn't that not the thing that Satan kept saying? If you're really the son of God, if you're really the son of God, then prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it how? Prove it by making sure there is no lack of provision. There is no lack of protection. There is no lack of presence. Prove it. So uh, you can't get water from a rock. It's too hard. But here's the lesson. God's grace flows in hard places. Is there anybody in the room who's glad about that? Yeah? His grace flows in hard places. We don't like being in a position where God is our only source. We prefer multiple options. But eventually, the multiple option resources in our life do dry up. What I will tell you is it's hard to learn to trust when you've got lots of options. Take the staff with which you struck the Nile. Then there's a phrase. We wouldn't notice it because our culture doesn't think like this. But God says, then I will stand before you. If we were in the ancient world, that would have stunned us. Such language would never have been written. It was inconceivable. It's not how the world worked. The greater does not stand before the lesser. You stand before God. You stand before kings. You stand before priests. You stand before prophets. They don't stand before you. But he says, I will stand before you. And he says, I will go over by the rock. Some translations even say on the rock. God is the one who's on trial. And what does God tell Moses to do? Take the rod of judgment and strike the rock. What is God doing here? He is submitting himself to judgment, not to their judgment, but to his own. And God was responding to the prayers of Moses. What shall I do? They are ready to stone me. Someone is going to die and it's going to be me. And what is God saying? I will take the judgment upon me. Does that sound even remotely familiar? God delivered his people by submitting to his own rod of judgment. He took the strike in Moses' place. Moses strikes the rock, and God opens up the rock, and water flows out of it. Moses had been on trial, but the truth is God had been on trial. And they blamed him for the problems that were in their life. So what is the sentence? The sentence is always the same. The sentence is death. They did it to Jesus. Jesus came and he healed and he spoke truth and he shined light. And he helped the poor. And he fed the hungry. He did remarkable things. He had no home. He knew what it was like to be hungry and thirsty. He knew what it was like to be deprived of all rights. And what did they do to him? They stripped him. They mocked him. They beat him and they condemned him to die. And then they crucified him. And what is happening on the cross? God is taking the judgment on himself. 
He's revealing his heart to us. He's teaching us how to trust in the midst of a hard time. And you say, oh, pastor, that's quite a stretch. You almost had me there. And that's quite a stretch. Well, this isn't my stretch. First Corinthians, the 10th chapter. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. To refer to God as a rock was a very common thing in the Old Testament. In Genesis and Isaiah, he's the stone of Israel. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, he's the rock that works perfection. In Psalms chapter 18, he's the rock that is a fortress and a refuge. In Psalm 95 and Deuteronomy 32, he's the rock of salvation. What is supposed to be stricken? The rock. What comes out? The water of life. I want the worship team to come up. This was a picture of how God would submit to the blow of his own justice. On the cross, Christ was struck with divine judgment. It was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. An angry world stands with clenched fists and blames God for all the things that go wrong in our life and all the things that we don't have in our life. And what does God do? He allows himself to be put on trial and the judgment comes down. And what comes out? Life, grace. When Jesus was pierced, tells us in scripture that out of his side came water and blood. In John chapter 4, Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I give, they will never be thirsty again. He would go on to say, the water that I give them, if they believe in me, they will become, it will become a spring of living water unto eternal life that wells up within them. Will you Allow God to teach you to trust him. Or have you decided that the only faith that will work for you is if no faith is required at all and you can walk from provision to provision, getting whatever you want well in advance? Will you put God on trial if something is not going the way you prefer in your life? Don't get me wrong. It's not wrong to tell God what you're afraid of. It's not wrong to tell God what you need. That's part of prayer. But we sometimes don't understand that. And we take it a step further and we put God on trial for what's not going well in our lives. The good news is, the good news is he understands. Jesus took the full blow of judgment of God and the water of life flowed freely from him. And the question is, will you drink from that water? Will you bow your heads? Maybe the question that you're asking in the season that you're in is how can anything good come out of this place of lack, this place of pain, this place of frustration, this place of anxiety? And I know it's hard. I've been in those places. I don't like them. I know what it's like to wonder and worry. But I can also tell you that what I've learned in my journey in life 
is that my greatest fears are not actually true. That God is not against me. And even when I falsely accuse him, He's ready in that midst of that hard and painful place to release the life that I need. And he'll do it for you. He'll do it for you today. If you'll trust him. So Father, we're not saying everything is wonderful, but we are looking to you. Will you release unto us today the waters of life? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. may have gotten in too soon. <laughs> so I'll tell you what, why don't you just sing that last chorus again? Your faithfulness, oh God, is new with the sunrise, a promise that never ends. Lift your voice. Your faithfulness, oh God, a beautiful sacrifice, a promise that never 
His promise never ends. Can we thank him for that this morning? Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. And um, when it comes to trust, uh, usually the conversation doesn't have to go long before it gets to something financial. This is the part where we practice generosity every Sunday. And uh, I mean, I can tell you lots of good things that happened with resources. I already shared one with you. Our, our first adoption assistance uh, a couple was helped out and there's a brand new family today. I think that's a really good thing, yeah. Or the church that just bought their very first building and they couldn't move into it because they weren't grandfathered regarding a sprinkler system. And our church wrote a check for $20,000 to send to them so they could worship in their space today. Yeah. <laughs> or the 1,100 students in Jamaica who received all of their school supplies and all the faculty members and teachers for those schools received things that you sent for them. And I could go on and on and on, but yeah, that's true. And we would all be very happy to know all those people were helped, but the question still comes down to, will you trust God? Not just to use those resources well, but to replenish the resources you let go of. And you get to take that step or not. And I will not twist your arm. You're in the presence of God today. And you can decide if today's the time and the place to trust Him with all of your life. Heavenly Father, thank you. You have provided for us. And we're learning to trust you. Would you help us do that better? In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you want to contribute today, you can do two ways. If you're on campus, uh, you can reach and use an envelope that's in the seat back pocket in front of you. Place your gift in there. It's an extra layer of security and privacy. You can place that in the container when it goes by. You can also give online, which is what most people do. You can go to R, which stands for Rochester, rcalvary.org forward slash give, and there'll be a convenient and secure way for you to practice generosity there. Thank you. Good morning. So I feel like sometimes at the holiday uh, time of the year, it can be a really stressful time. And sometimes for us, we just want to experience some good joy and laughter and fun. And that is why I wanted to invite you today to our adult Christmas party. That's going to be happening on Friday, December 15th evening. And it's going to be a really enjoyable, enjoyable sure. evening for sure, where uh, we're going to have some really good food, catered chicken French and ziti from Manja Manja. So you know that's going to be a W. And then uh, we're going to have like a bunch of really fun, interactive games with the tables and stuff. It's going to be a great time. And there's also something new uh, for the Christmas party this year that we're doing for the first time ever, a dessert competition. Uh, so for those of you like, I make the best cookies around, prove it, okay? <laughs> And you'll be able to register your dessert and you don't have to make one for the entire, you know, group, but just we say like a small serving of like six to eight people. Uh, so if that's something you'd like to do, like show off your skills, we're, we're really excited to do that. This year Are you well. volunteering to be one of the judges? I am. <laughs> do anything for Jesus, right? Anything. You know, whatever it takes <laughs> to serve the Lord. <laughs> So, uh, I, you know what? I feel the Lord calling me too, actually, in this moment. Cra yeah, right. Wow. Wow. Crazy how the Lord can work, even in announcement time. So, uh, yeah, I want to let you know that uh, registration is open now. There is an early bird discount available if you want to take advantage of that. And if you are a volunteer here at our church, if you volunteer in any kind of regular way, uh, we want to uh, pay for your night to be able to come to say thank you for all that you do to make this place uh, run and go in a safe place. Yes, we're so thankful for you, our volunteers as well. And uh, there will be childcare available as well. Uh, we just ask that you register your kids ahead of time. 
The very last thing uh, we want you to be aware about is we have something new that's coming uh, to Calvary, and we're really thrilled to share this with you. Uh, this week, on Tuesday, we are launching the first ever episode of the Calvary Assembly podcast. Ooh, dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. So if you're like, man, I just can't get enough of Stephen and Jonathan talking nonsense. <laughs> but Pastor Bob's on there too, so it's got some needed, wisdom, actually. We need to level it out a little bit. <laughs> uh, but we're thrilled. Uh, we're, this is our first one. We, had, we just recorded another one the other day too. And this conversation, essentially it's about the, the more difficult aspects and parts of Scripture and some of the more difficult stories that you find in there. We're going to be talking about it. Uh, and we want to invite you into that. And this specific one is, is uh, centered around, can prayer change the will of God. And it's a story where Israel is, is worshiping a golden calf and God's like, I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses seemingly seems to change God's mind. And uh, what's that about? So we're going to be talking about that. So we hope that you listen to that on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. You can watch it there as well. Uh, and our goal is we're not just attempting to have fun conversations. Our goal is that we can grow in our faith together, even outside of a Sunday morning, that there's another aspect, an avenue, where you can grow and, to, and strengthen your relationship and your faith with God. Um, so we hope you check that out this week. Oh, wow. Applause. Wow. wow. I'm going to encourage you to stand and let's go to the Lord before we pray and before we go into our amazing Thanksgiving week. Father, we pray that our faith is truly that. Then when, when the rock in front of our lives seems like it's overwhelming, that we can experience the flow of your grace, that water would pour forward and that we can trust and rely on you. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, and we rely on your goodness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, have an awesome week. Have an awesome Thanksgiving. We'll see you soon.